Okay, so I've, I've been caring for wildlife for about eight years. It kind of started when I found a koala in my palm tree in my front yard and I phoned everybody to come and take the koala away. The plan was always to have a property where I could rehabilitate. Uh, we bought the property in 2019 when the fires hit and we had so many animals in care at our, at our home at Carina that we couldn't even get down here until January. So we started off slowly and as the money dribbled in, we were able to build uh, purpose-built enclosures for animals. So the first thing to do when we, when we came here was we had to plant our trees. We've planted in excess of 600 eucalyptus trees specifically to feed our koalas in care eventually. And then slowly but surely we, you know, we built our koala enclosures, we built our glider enclosures, our echidna enclosure. As the donations and the small grants that we get come in, we're able to then build larger and more purpose-built enclosures for specific species. Generally, a member of public will phone us, let us know what's going on. By that time, I've usually got my keys in my hand and I'm pretty much out the door straight away. Stay on the phone with the caller and try and get as much information as we can on the koala and the situation at hand. So we usually get there, assess the situation, you know, any danger, I suppose, and then we usually get our gear and, and get to work getting the koala rescued. A rescue varies, See, like a koala on a fence, you know, you can usually get that koala within a few minutes to an hour and sometimes some diseased koalas who are in 40 metre trees can take days. They're not always, you know, happy stories. Most, most of the time, unfortunately, they're not. They're sad stories, you know, where there's, you know, a diseased koala who doesn't make it or a dog attack koala who doesn't make it. And unfortunately, those numbers outweigh the good stories. So the koala comes usually when it's been rescued, it comes via a hospital where it's been given the all clear to come into care to be raised and rehabilitated. Generally goes into a small enclosure so we can assess it for the first few days, monitor it really closely that it's eating, it possibly needs milk if it's a joey. And then from there it goes into a larger enclosure and then it's fed fresh leaf every day. Hopefully it just grows big and strong and goes on to the next stage of rehabilitation. Rehabilitating is very timely and very costly. It costs quite a bit of money for the formulas, for the animal milks and things like that. It costs almost $110 a month to care for one koala and sometimes you've got five to eight in care, you know, and it's, uh, yeah, very time consuming and costly. People were coming to me and saying, oh, they've never seen a koala in White Seal, they've never, never seen a koala in this area, until it's shown to people that they are out there and it's just because you haven't seen one doesn't mean to say they're not there. People need to be educated about what's going on around them. At the moment, we've been given the opportunity to translocate our baby koalas or our joey koalas, which is very exciting. We're working with UQ to release koalas into different areas and different habitats. At the same time, these koalas are being monitored. Then at least that way we can see that they're doing well. And that's really important. It's really early days for us, but it's also very exciting news. We get a lot of public feedback from people who say, you know, I've seen this number, I've seen, you know, to know that he's okay, he's doing well, and we can, you know, phone and find out what his information was, where he's come from, how long he's been out. That sort of information's pretty relevant and really important that the public phone in for. Most of the time it's heartbreaking. Most of the time these stories are heartbreaking. And I try and save people those sorts of stories. But unfortunately, it's a reality. Unfortunately, it's a reality. Or a dog, you know, or a koala who's been played with by three dogs. They're not playing with the koala. They're, you know, that koala's likely not going to make it. You know, the caller says to you, is it going to be okay? And you know it's not. What do you say? You know, what do you say? You know, what do you say?
Sometimes I have no words and I come back here and I bawl my eyes out, but that's reality. And the ones you get to save are the great stories and they, every single one of those is great. We cannot afford to lose the koalas at the numbers we are losing right now. We are not going to have koalas in the wild to be able to see. Your grandkids are not going to be able to see koalas in the wild. You're going to have to pay to go to a zoo or a facility to see a koala. And that's the reality. I think donating is the big one because I don't think people realise how costly it is to do what we do. 100% of the donations go directly to the animals, whether it's for fuel to get them to a hospital, medication, food to, to feed the animal, transport to release the animal or to get it to a vet. We need the donations to keep our doors open. It's 24 seven, it's very time consuming and it's very costly. To be able to rescue a koala and rehabilitate a koala that can then be released back into the wild is everything. I mean, you're one by one trying to save the species. It may just be one koala, but it's one more koala out there and every life matters. Look, the highlights, I think every day is a highlight for me. I get to do this. I get to, you know, look into the eyes of these unbelievably unique species. I'm honoured to do what I do. Every day is a highlight. I'm very, very fortunate to do what I do. Very, very lucky to have a team around me that help me do what I do. Um, you know, every day is a highlight for me.